Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. A major theme throughout the Bible is trust God to take care of your needs. And doesn't he normally overwhelmingly do that? He gives you food, he gives you clothing, he gives you a roof over your head. More than anything, he provided a savior. So a major theme throughout the Bible is try not to worry, try to trust that somehow God is going to meet your needs. Now, you might say, but what about atheists? They don't trust God to meet their needs and they have food and clothing. Well, they do, and the difference is they don't realize that it's coming from God. <laughs> Way back about 500 years ago, Martin Luther wrote the small catechism, a commentary on the Lord's Prayer, and here's what Luther wrote. Give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? God gives daily bread even without our prayer to all wicked men, but we pray in this petition that he would lead us to know it and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. So God meets our needs, he meets the atheist needs. What we want to talk about today is trust that God is going to meet all your needs, not all your wants, but all your needs. We are going to look today at a miracle called the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle, aside from Christ's resurrection, that is found in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So this is an important miracle. Let us see that the point is going to be now, in this miracle, especially when you have no idea how God is going to do it, trust Him to meet your needs. Would you take out a Bible, turn to John chapter 6, and let's pray before we begin. Father, some people watching this show are having financial needs or they're having a crisis in their marriage or their children are in trouble or their health is in trouble. Lord, we would pray that you would help us not worry today, but to trust you to meet our needs. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs, the miracles that he was doing on the sick. So here's the first lesson today. Miracles can cause people to follow Jesus. Maybe you're watching the show A Believer in Christ today because of some miracle Jesus did for you five years ago. But I say miracles can cause people to follow Jesus because sometimes miracles don't work. You remember the Pharisees. They saw Jesus do miracles. But what did they say? Well, he does them, but he does them by the power of the devil. So you can see a real bona fide miracle and still say no to Christ. I had an agnostic friend who used to say, well, if God would just appear to me, if he'd show up in a fiery vision, I'd believe in God. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Couldn't you say after it was over, hallucination? So miracles are great things. They can cause faith, but sometimes they don't work. Years ago, I'm on the plane, and the man next to me is a doctor. He finds out I'm a preacher, and he says, I became a Christian in medical school. I said, well, what converted you? And he said, when I started to study the human body and how miraculously and intricately designed the human body is, I had to conclude there's a designer to this design. <laughs> That's what converted him. On the other hand, there are other people, when they look at the wonderfully designed human body, what their conclusion is, it's the process of blind evolution caused by chance. <laughs> so even a miracle doesn't work on a hard heart. But let me say this, 
It's always safe to err in the direction of believing in God rather than not believing in God. Let me tell you a story. The story goes that many, many years ago, an atheist lecturer was speaking in England. Very eloquent, he stood before the large crowd and demolished Christianity with his arguments. At the end of the night, he said to the crowd, any questions? An old peasant woman in the back put up her hand. Now, sir, you are so much wiser than I am, and I have no education, but can I ask you a question? I have believed in Jesus my whole life. I find much comfort in knowing my sins are forgiven. I've got a Savior in this life and an eternity in the next. If when I die, I discover there is no God, there is no Jesus, there's no heaven, what will I have lost by believing in him in this life? He said, well, ma'am, I don't know that you'd have lost anything. And she said, thank you. And let me just ask one more question. Sir, when you die, if you discover there is a God, there is a Jesus Christ, there is a heaven and a hell, what, sir, will you stand to lose? And the story goes, the crowd stood, applauded the woman, and the atheist sat down. (laughs) You know, sometimes miracles work. Sometimes they don't, but it's always safe to err in the direction of God. If we're wrong, we're wrong, but that's the safest route. Verse 3, John chapter 6, verse 3. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, one of the twelve, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Here's the next lesson. Sometimes Jesus tests us. I I think Jesus is saying here, Okay, Philip, you've seen me do huge huge miracles. Here's a hundred o'clock crowd. What do you think I might be able to do? And I think what happens sometimes, God lets a huge need pop up in your life to test us to see, Will you trust me with this, that I'm going to get you through this? Let's see how Philip did. Uh, Verse 6. Philip answered Jesus, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. In other words, Philip didn't get it. (laughs) He didn't pass the test. Uh, 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 He failed to remember the power of Christ, and he's thinking of the budget. So here's here's the next lesson. We often fail the test. You know why I believe the New Testament? Its heroes look so bad. (laughs) Remember, Philip's one of the 12 apostles. The 12 apostles were the heroes of the early church. If the early church is going to dream up a book and make up stories, they're going to make their apostles look good. Read the New Testament. The apostles look bad. (laughs) Which makes me think there's a ring of historicity and truthfulness to the New Testament. Verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many people? Here's the next lesson. Give Jesus what little you have and see what he does with it. I mean, send $100 to Samaritan's Purse to help the people in, you know, Haiti or Nepal or something. And God can do miracles with little stuff. I will tell you, about three years ago, we were just on the edge of closing this ministry down. I mean, we probably would have kept doing it in Minneapolis, but the national ministry, we were going to close down because the money wasn't coming in. Except on December 31st, right at the last day of the year, God bless this couple that sent us the biggest gift we ever got, $40,000. Well, that enabled us to keep going. And now we're still going, and we still have enough money to stay on national TV. My point is, whatever God has given you, whether it's little or much, put it in the hands of Jesus and see what he does with it. Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, 
Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Here's the main point of this story. God is more than able to meet your needs. That is the symbolism of 12 baskets left over full. And, and think about that. Isn't it true that God has more than met your needs? I mean, most of you watching this show, myself included, have more enough than enough food, more than enough clothing. I mean, overwhelmingly, God meets more than our needs. And you can say, well, yeah, but I'm a Christian and, and I, I, there, I, I lack money. Well, he doesn't meet all your wants, <laughs> but he does meet all your needs. And Christian, all we really need is a simple life in Jesus. That's what we need. Now, I want to tell you one of my favorite stories. There's a story that many years ago, a wealthy Norwegian farmer stood on his porch looking over the valley. He owned all the land his eyes could see. He lived in a big mansion. And that morning he decided to take a walk. And he walks on his property to the little shack where old Hans, one of his hired hands, lives. And he walks up to Hans, and Hans is like this, and, well, good morning, Hans. Well, good morning, sir. Well, what are you doing? Well, I'm just praying over my, my breakfast here. Well, that's not much for breakfast. Well, it's all I need. I, I, I'm pretty simple. But strange, sir, that you should stop by today. I had a dream last night. And the dream said, the richest man in the valley will die tonight. And I wondered if that was a warning for you, sir. Well, the farmer kind of brushed it off and went on his way. But later that afternoon, he got nervous and he called for the town doctor. <clears throat> the town doctor came out to his house, examined the wealthy farmer and said, the richest man in the valley is not going to die tonight. Well, the farmer invited the doctor to stay for dinner. They stayed up, they had, they smoked their cigars, had their vodka or whatever. And, but 10 o'clock that night, a knock on the door. And the, doc, the farmer got a little nervous, but he went to answer the door. And here's one of his young farm hands. Sir, didn't mean to disturb you, but just thought you'd want to know. Old Hans died tonight. <laughs> the point of that story is, Christians, we don't need much. God meets our needs. Look at verse six, chapter 6 of John, verse 14. When the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, let me ask you something. Was Jesus a prophet? Well, he was, but he was so much more than that. He's God in human form who came down to earth. Um, but you wouldn't have gotten that from the miracle. So here's the next point. Miracles can only teach so much. Miracles can teach you that Jesus is real and that he's got power, but that he is the eternal second person of the Godhead, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God for all eternity. You're not going to get that from a miracle. You need, for that, you need the scriptures and the church. So let me just stop and ask this question. What is your relationship right now to the scriptures and the church? Do you go to church every week? Do you have a good Christian church to go to? Do you, do you know the scriptures? Do you read the scriptures regularly? Miracles are great things, but they don't teach you all that much. For that, you need the scriptures and the church. Verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about, the crowd was about to come and take Jesus by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Here's the last lesson. Jesus waited on God's timing. The crowd wanted to make Jesus king right now, but Jesus had a timetable to his life. No, first I have to die on the cross, rise from the dead, and then I'll be king, not just of the Jews, but of the universe. So Jesus doesn't follow the crowd's timing. He gets alone with God on the mountain and remembers, I need to follow God's timing to get the biggest blessing. Is there something you need to slow down about and not rush and wait on God's timing to get the biggest blessing. I'll tell you what I thought of. 
way back in 1996, I was a pastor in the ELCA Lutheran Church, the liberal branch of Lutheranism. I discovered they were paying for abortions with offering dollars, abortion for any reason, sex selection, you name it. They will pay for abortion for any reason in the ELCA Lutheran healthcare plan funded by offering dollars. So I wrote letters to 11,000 churches back then saying, what are we doing? It went to the National Assembly in 1997 of the ELCA. Some people got up and say, said, how can we use offering dollars to kill unborn children? We lost two to one. I came back to my church, Hope Lutheran, and I said, let's get out of this denomination. And the elders wanted to get out too, but, but they said, the timing doesn't seem right. So we waited another four years, and I think there was a purpose in that, that God wanted me to keep preaching on this for a few more years. But at the end of four years, one of the elders said basically, it seems to me that the timing is right. We had a vote to leave the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, got something like 93%, but you know what was amazing? When we had the vote, we did not lose one person over that vote. I get emails from people, oh, Pastor Brock, our church is split because of the liberalism in the ELCA and half the church is left. We didn't lose one person. And my point is, when people say to me, should I leave the ELCA, I say yes, but I say to the pastors, but make sure you pray about it and do it in the Lord's timing. So one last thing, our main point today was trust that God will meet your needs. But let me ask a very hard question before we're done. What about the needs of the 500 Nigerians who were macheted to death by militant Muslims? Why didn't God meet their needs? Listen to this. Nigerian Muslims murdered 500 Christians in the village of Dogo Nawata near the city of Josh. Most of the victims were women and children. The Muslims shouted, Allah Akbar, God is great, invading the village at 2 a.m. yesterday, slaughtering the Christians with machetes. Churches were burned, uh, whole families were killed. They burned down several uh, churches. 380 Christians were buried in one mass burial. Um, uh, and, and then the uh, Reverend John Hayab of the Christian Association of Nigeria, quote, the genocide committed by Muslims against innocent women and children is another clear demonstration of Muslim brutality and intolerance of Christianity in northern Nigeria. Uh, and he calls upon the government, he calls upon Christians all over the world to pray. Now you can ask, well, why didn't God meet those 500 Nigerians' needs and protect them? And here's my thought. God did. Here's, here's the last point today. Our biggest need as Christians is to glorify God. The reason you and I are on the planet is to glorify God. So sometimes, whether we know it or not, our need is to suffer and die for the sake of Christ. And, and because that glorifies God. Now you could say, well, how did that glorify God that these 500 Nigerians were killed? Well, it taught us three things. Number one, Jesus is worth dying for. It teaches us that. Number two, it teaches us Muslims and Islam is not a good religion. When's the last time you heard of, heard of Presbyterians killing 500 Muslims? You don't hear that. And you know the third thing it, it does? It teaches us that we Christians in America need to be willing to suffer too. So. Let me just ask one question in, clothing, in closing. Can you see <laughs> that God is going to take care of your needs? Not your wants, but he's going to take care of your needs. Your biggest need is to glorify God. And you could say, well, those, those Nigerians, they, God met their need. Because you know what? In heaven, they've got all their needs met one way or another. Who knows how and when, and, but one way or another, the Bible teaches God is going to take care of your needs in this life or the next. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of Scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, we've talked about needs and wants. 
Can you clarify for me, though, is it wrong for people to pray for a, something they want mm -hmm. or only for their needs? I think it's okay to pray for almost anything, Jackie, but then you close the prayer in Jesus' name, which means only if this is your will, Lord Jesus, is this in line. Like, you, know, you remember the, the quote, Billy Graham's wife said, quote, I, I have lived to thank God that he has not answered all my prayers. If he had, I would have married the wrong man five times. <laughs> so you can really want, Lord, please may this be the person I'm supposed to marry. But if, if God thinks that's not the person, you don't want that prayer answered. So I think you can ask for everything, but I always end my prayer, but God only do this if it's your will. Okay, so by asking God to do it if it's his will, mm -hmm. it's all right, and maybe you'll get the answer of whether it's just a want and not a, a need. Or a need, that's okay. right. Okay, all right, <clears throat> can you, what are some of the groups, you talked about persecution and that, what are some of the groups that are helping these persecuted Christians? Yeah, I'll tell you a place I send my money. It's called International Christians Concern. You just go to persecution.org, and you'll get their website. They'll send you a free magazine every month, and then they'll show you how to pray for people. And you can donate, either uh, write them on the address, persecution.org. Another great organization is called Voice of the Martyrs, which helps Christians around the world. Those are two good ones. Okay. Can you explain what is Pascal's challenge? Mm -hmm. I've never heard of this either. Pascal, Pascal. Was, a, was a French philosopher. And his, ch you remember, I, if you heard the sermon, Jackie, the, the old lady that said to the atheist, if I die and find out there's no God, big deal. If you die and find out there's no God, big deal. <laughs> That's Pascal's challenge. Pascal basically, I think he was back in the 1700s, he basically said, if Christians are wrong, okay, but if the unbelievers who reject Christ are wrong, my. So why not bet in the safer direction? Okay. Do you think it's wrong for Christians to save up money? Um, I think it's wrong to hoard. I, I don't think it's wrong to save up for, you know, your retirement or for, for this or that. I don't think anything's wrong with that. But on the other hand, <coughs> American Christians are about the wealthiest Christians on earth. I think we should be giving so much more to foreign missions. We tend to give all of our money in America as Christians to our church, and it's important to tithe to your church. But then your offerings, which is above your 10%, should go to, to foreign missions and to all kinds of things. So I think we can do a lot better than we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess, how can you say that God is meeting our needs when we've seen Christians that are starving to death, though, mm -hmm. and that? You know, now this is going to sound weird. D now, you know, some of the health and wealth preachers might tell you Christians never, never starve to death, and if they do, it's because they don't have enough faith. I think that's baloney. I think there are sincere Christians who, in prison, have been starved to death because of their faith. They've been tortured to death because of their faith. So where is God meeting their needs? I think there's two answers. Like I said, our biggest need as Christians is to glorify God. That's our biggest need. So if the way I'm going to glorify God is to suffer in prison, thy will be done, Lord. But then the second answer is God does provide all of our needs and wants in heaven. That's where they're ultimately taken care of. Do you think people have lost glorifying God as part of the thing they're supposed to do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I... You know what I pray for the persecuted Christians? Lord, may they give them strength. May they not deny you. But if they do, may they repent and may you forgive them and take them back. That's what I pray, you know. Because, Jackie, if, if somebody put a gun to my head and, curse, and said, curse Christ, I sure hope I wouldn't do it. I w wouldn't curse Christ. Um, but if I did, I, you know, I, I hope and trust God would forgive me when I repented. But I, really, Jackie, I'd rather, you, you got to die anyway. Why not die for Christ? What better way to die? <laughs> so. You know, Pastor Brock, there's TV preachers that are on that have all these gimmick type things. Like mm -hmm. if you send me money, God's going to do a miracle for yeah. you. Yeah. Or, um, you know, I'll give you something that will help you. What do you do about those kind of things? Uh, Jackie? I was, on, I was on YouTube a while ago, and something popped up, Christian Healers Comedy Hours, it was, it was something like that, and somebody had made a tape, a, a video, 
taking clips out of these horrible TV preachers. You send me that gift, I'm going to send you this miracle spring water from Jerusalem. And you put that miracle spring water on your body. My faith has gone into this water. It's going to go in. What absolute baloney. And, and then one of them had the nerve to, and he's the worst on TV. I'd, I'd like to give you his name. But he, it's all money, money, money. He writes all these Christian books, how God's going to make you a millionaire. And, and you send your... 500 people are supposed to send me $800. So 500 people are supposed to sow an $800 seed. Now you send that money in, you're going to reap your miracle. And then he tells stories that, I mean, it's just horrible, Jackie. And I think that guy is, is going to, and you know, he had, had the nerve to say, now God strike me dead if I'm doing this for my personal financial gain. I'm thinking, I wouldn't pray that if I was you. But um, th these people are giving Christianity a bad name. You go to YouTube, they've done clips of these people because the unbelievers laugh at us because of people like this. So I'm, I'm telling you, give money to good groups that are, that are you know, the inter what's it called? The uh, ICFA, International, no, what's it called? F the fina Financial, F, Financial, What's, what's the seal? FI, the Financial Council of Accountability. Anyway, make sure you send it to good Christian ministries like Campus Crusade for Christ, Samaritan's Purse, good Christian missionaries. Beware of men that want you to send them $400 so you get their spring oil. Give me a break. Well, this has been an interesting program, and we've only got 40 seconds <laughs> left. I get upset when I think of those people. But we've learned a little bit of things that are a little bit different today, I think, too. <laughs> so do you want to close and tell people what's sure. happening lately? Well, everybody, by the grace of God, we're still on the air. We're a simple outfit here. I'm the only one that gets a salary, and it's kind of modest. Everybody else in our ministry does everything, all the technical stuff, volunteer, Jackie, Fred, all of our camera people. Pray. If the Lord might have you uh, support us, if so, go to pastorstudy.org, two S's. You can donate there or you can send us a, a, uh, something in the mail. You can watch all of our TV shows for free there. But it's because of God's abundance that we're still on the air. So pray for our ministry. That's even more important than anything else. Pray for our ministry, and we'll see you again next time at the Pastor Study. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always.